Well, here we are, boys. This is uh, the Fargonauts here. We're watching more Twin Peaks, and this is going to be a doozy. It's the penultimate. Episode 17, The Past Dictates the Future. Oh, the penis made episode? Yes. There we go. Um, the last episode was No Knock Nor Doorbell, and that was a big a big one where um, Ooh, a lot of shit. Coop wakes up. <laughs> Hell yeah, and, yeah uh, Coop, Coop made a move. Diane made a move. Uh, yes. I am the FBI. Who else? I Mr. C? FBI. What was he doing last episode? Oh, he cool. uh, brought Richard out to the middle of nowheres. Yep. Did yep. His little Sacrificed his ass. Peaky poo into who knows what. Right. Yeah, Coop, Coop woke up. Diane woke up. Or Diane's Talpa woke up. Uh, and Audrey woke up. Yeah. Yeah some crazy stuff i mean i'm just itching and ready to go so how about we jump into this next episode guys yes, let's do it please. here it is the penultimate we did it yeah the, that uh, was a penultimate dude. second to the last this, yeah this is like next time is going to be the last time that we get to watch twin peaks together for like a you know so what if what an episode Wow. We're, yeah, there's a lot that happened in this episode, and we'll try to not talk over each other and uh, kind of get. L let's just go through our initial thoughts. What do you guys think of this one, like, overall? I, th I thought it was one of the stronger episodes of the season so far. It just, like, even if things weren't clear, it laid a lot out and hit. A lot of tones that were like we're we're in the deep end now and it, it just played in that that feeling of like building tension building mystery um showing you something that was like inexplicable and just just really operating in that world so it was a really good time i thought how about you eric what do you think of this one loved it anything stand out to you that was really um Interesting. Um, the or... thing that so other than the Coop. James, <laughs> yeah, 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 scene. Yeah. What do you think? Yes, James. <laughs> well, James. Um, no, we were so like they made a point to reference numerology stuff earlier with the number ten being a sign of completion, right? And then when they were in the sheriff's office during all that stuff and the clock w w with him and Diane. And the clock was sitting on um, fucking 354 or whatever. And that equaled 11. And uh, well, I looked up quick what 11 is in numerology. And 11 is considered a master number, which means it has a unique vibration and a high level of spiritual significance. More significant than the, just that is it's thought to represent a bridge between the physical and spiritual realms, which is what we got in that situation, which was pretty cool. I liked that the most. Yeah. What did you guys feel about that, that scene in the sheriff's station? And we'll, we'll get to that, I guess more in depth once we get through it. But like the initial thing when like everything's kind of converging and it all is happening at the sheriff's station where all these different elements that have been kind of peppered in throughout the return all show up to bear witness to like, Bob's return and the um, I guess more specifically is that over the whole scene in the aftermath we saw that low opacity face of Cooper kind of just staring there's so many things that this show or in this episode kind of gave me a sense of like when they talk about the dream, who's the dreamer? And that's been like a, a reoccurring thing in the later yeah. stages of this series is like, whose dream is this? And should we like find out what the significance of whoever's dreaming this dream is? Um, there was just something about that overlapping of Coop's face as he gazed on Nido's face. It seemed to me like what you're saying, Bracho, is that the time stood still in that moment, but the scene continued with, you know, people talking over each other and things like that, but 
something stood still. Like time so stood still in that moment for a long time when he looked into Naito's face and just stared. So I'm I'm stuck on that. That's my initial uh, take from this episode, really. Um, but overall, I was enthralled the whole time, especially with this scene here. Gordon having some Bordeaux <laughs> with his crew talking about <laughs> the whole shebang. Having with, a bureau Bordeaux. Um, how he's he apologized to Albert. He's like, I'm sorry. He's like, I know, that's fine. He's like, yeah, but I'm still sorry. Talking about all these things he had to keep away from Albert with his um, talks with Cooper and Major Briggs and all, uh, this, the whole significance with that because uh, it was very hush hush. Jow day. The Jow day talk. That's that's what else. That's another thing that um, comes up, and I don't know if it's mentioned previously. The name Judy was it? Uh, the only time that I can think of off the top of my head is when Philip Jeffries is appearing in the FBI office, and he says, "What? Well, we're not going to talk about Judy. We're not going to mention her at all." And then in Fire Walk with Me at the very, very end, the fucking like two second clip of the monkey comes up and the monkey says the name Judy. Right. So that's what I'm aware of. Correct. Um, let's see. I'm trying to place things in my head here of how it's been talked about, but really hush hush, like with Hawk and Sheriff Truman talking about that symbol of Judy. And he's mm -hmm. like, we don't talk about that. You don't ever want to know about that. Yeah. So in in a roundabout way, Judy's been discussed throughout this series. Um, yeah. The what Judy is came in that episode, if you recall the the signature episode where the atomic bomb goes off and everything happens there with Judy barfing up all these little evil pellets um, and one of them happens to be um, Bob and I guess what do you think that is so if we basically say Judy is the embodiment of like fear suffering sorrow pain whatever else negative the barfing up of Bob is just like what like another facet of her to like go like it's her dream or it's her well uh, i don't know is it she's, part of her or is it she's conjuring yeah. a evil sense of like a i think in some way it's like it's like the dinosaurs in jurassic park like she's procreating basically or or she is spreading her if she, if she is a entity that either represents or feeds on negativity sorrow pain all these like negative emotions then she is like using a way to spread that or spread something throughout the world or universe that will help to increase her influence in that way she'll be able to like feed off of more or or the garmon bozia that that bob creates it that tasty ends green up corn in her pocket somehow later on. I I don't know, but she's like, it it seems like yeah, she's spreading a part of herself or creating something from her to like. It's like a, it's like a president assigning a new general or some shit like that. It's like, you know, you're you may not be doing exactly what I tell you at all times, but your goals overall will align with mine, whether you like it or not. You operate under me, and so it, it's it's just like her dissemination of her, of her like goals, kind of. I don't know. I think there's some truth to that. Yeah. Um, I don't know how else to say well, that. I think that but is similar like to child of, the fireman. Of... Then the fireman has that same kind of instinct then, to create something. The complete anti version of Jow Day or Judy's conjuration you know 
that's why the fireman conjures up the idea of Laura Palmer being like the pure orb goodness to counteract that and balance it out. And then even, uh, what's her face? Lady D kisses the orb, if you no. recall. She like kisses the orb before it goes to wherever the fireman's, you know, dreaming. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something to that too. Like, are we, is it Lady D's dream? And the fireman is yeah. dreaming up these ideas for her. And who who's, who's, who's Lady D? <laughs> Who's Lady D's not? Um, I mean, we certainly don't get any sort of explanation in that way, so it's it's really up to us to just feel it out and decide for ourselves. Who's this? Who's this fucker? Why does he claw at his face? Yeah, this this guy seems otherworldly too. He seems like a blue. Yeah, or he seems like a tulpa. He seems weird. Like he's like an apparition of some kind, because there's, I think there's only like, the only people to ever truly acknowledge his presence are, that that crooked cop, and like maybe like James or somebody like gives him like a, a weird look, but like, mm -hmm. I think I think very few repeat, I think very few people actually like, actively turn to him and are like recognizing yes you are a person that is present. Right. So it's strange in and of itself, not to mention what he's what he is, what he does. So we get the scene here of, you know, putting in the... getting all the puzzle pieces in an order. So, um, yeah, as the scenes play out in this, in this episode, we kind of know, like, why this person's here, um, why they're chirping, and why they can't really talk. And, um, James and... Um, what's the other guy's name? James and Hulk hands, I guess. Freddy. Freddy, right. Freddy, James yeah. and Freddy are, are right where they need to be. Like that's, that's something that's kind of interesting is that they were supposed to be here. Like some kind of weird situation happened where it was fate and it was like serendipity that they show up at this location during this time. Because we needed Hulk hands to save the day towards the end. Hell yeah, dude. This scene was kind of a throwaway because we never really returned, but we just know that Jerry's fine, just naked somewhere in Wyoming. So that's that. Yep. <laughs> that's all we know from that scene. Um, and then we get uh, Doppelkoop going to Jackrabbit Palace, where Major Briggs um, brought Bobby when he was younger. Um but this time, Jackrabbit Palace becomes more smoky, and there's like a what would you call that? Like, was it supposed to look like the oil or something? Yeah, like it was pond? It, the little pond, and the tree was like supposed to directly, uh, you know, harken back to the kind of setup that was there for Glastonbury Grove, where it's like I think that's supposed to be a sycamore tree, and and back there there were like you know six or eight of them in a circle with that little pond in the middle uh -huh. so it's like it's like the doors open here at jack rabbit palace with the smoke coming out and the i don't i don't think these things were uh, we'd have to go back and look i don't think these things were like present or visible when no uh i don't remember andy and them bobby looking. and all those people came up here yeah they were kind of positioned by that overturned tree trunk and andy which is was looking up that's on the left side of the frame. It looks like there, the uh, overturned tree trunk. You can kind of see it, like behind some of the, yeah, right there too. He mm -hmm. he he walks around it, and yeah. Yep. So it, yeah, it's like I don't know. Some some in some way or another, this location is ready to accept somebody to enter, or it's like ready for Mister C to cross over. I'm I'm not sure. Was he just carrying a rock? No, he's got that device, that like GPS device that he's was carrying with Richard, and he was like, "Show it to him." And oh yeah, that shows two different places. Yeah, it's got the coordinates. Like he he received three sets of coordinates, and two of them matched. So the two that matched were the trap, 
And the real one is Jackrabbit's Palace. Right. So we'll go from there to when he gets uh, raptured, I guess. And um, <laughs> he gets taken and put into a cage. That's what that sure symbolizes. Does. Like, he's he's prisoned inside this... I don't know. I want to, like, come up with, like, a... What is this? Is this, like, the dream mind? Because from what we've known, the fireman is just, like, p floating there. And yeah. we know that he conjured up, like, a bunch of stars out of nowhere and formed it into the idea of Laura and put that into the screen. Mm -hmm. Um... So this is where he, like, develops parts of a dream. I, I, it, it, this is like the uh, departure gate at the airport where the the products, whether it's an oral orb or whatever it may be, like, goes from this place to somewhere else. Right. And we have a Major Briggs, very stoic, stable, just floating in this realm um do you guys have any take on the significance of why he's there who's there why briggs is there why briggs yeah. is witnessing doppelkoop being caged and put back into a new projection I, I the only thing that i can read is that major briggs because in his in his life he talked about like what if love i'm afraid that love is not enough and he's he's talking about these ideas of the white lodge and etc i think that he what i don't know that if this is the white lodge let's just call this the waiting room for the white lodge right like if the other place is the waiting room for the black lodge or it's or it's just a its own thing because like my my thought is maybe maybe Briggs is maybe like the like an like through what he was doing it was almost an agent of the fireman, you know what sure. I mean? Sure. So he he gets a place in this realm with him, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm almost looking at it like like the fireman is like God of some sort, you know what I mean? Sure. And yeah. uh, he seems like a tool though too. I'm just saying that I, I because guess, I guess yeah. they use him to create these conjurations and then his he's like if he's a guy he should be like pulling levers and doing things. He's just like he can't do But much. he kind of does though. He but makes He is here though, yeah. He makes He's putting things into place. Before he right? floats up, he like moves through, he like doesn't he interact with one of the teapots or something like or or I don't know that he pulls a lever, but he like he does something. But Ever since he's dreamt of Laura back in the day, he's been floating there. Like, that's the last time we saw him. He was just floating. Yeah. That's that's what I said. I was like, oh, he's still here. Like, that seemed like it was at least however long, like 25 years ago. It, yeah. But time works differently. We don't know if it's like the same moment here. You know, who knows? Well, but, uh, we know it's different now because we don't see Lady D. We now see Major Briggs. Um, before was, then, was Major Briggs there before? He might have appeared before. He wasn't. He wasn't here in this realm. He we saw his face floating over that purple river, saying "Blue yep. Rose, Blue Rose." But yep. now we just see him as a part of this happenstance. I think it's because the last time we saw Doppelcoop was at Jackrabbit Palace, which is significant to Major Briggs. So there's a connection there, at least with. Um, somehow, because the connection with Major Briggs, Bobby, and the Jackrabbit Palace, and the investigations that he's been doing with Blue Rose, he should be here to witness this because it kind of all came from those signals or whatever Major Briggs was doing in his time sure. when he was alive. I, I think I agree with Eric where... I also see it as like Major Briggs, uh, through the efforts of his life, was like a warrior for the side of good. And now in his afterlife, whatever, whatever, because they kind of laid it out later in the episode where they're like, something happened that that caused uh, Major uh, Major Briggs to disappear, uh, to Coop, for Cooper to dis to disappear. And I, 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 yeah, I think that he was allowed 
to be able to like fulfill this role after his death. And that's what he's doing now is just this is where he is. This is who he is. He's an overseer or like an agent of the of the fireman. I don't know. All right. Yeah, we'll continue. I'll I'll ponder this more. But yeah, the fireman is still there from when we saw him during the atomic bomb scenes of that one episode. Still floating, still having that smoker jacket. And still floating. <laughs> still floating, still fly. And then he swipes and he moves. He moves the Palmer household to like the scene outside of the uh, sheriff's station there. Yeah. So he can like, we don't know if he was, the last time he was dreaming, he was dreaming of Laura. Like he's, we see Laura's house. And we don't know what time this is. We can assume that it's, you know, present day. Dang. I wonder if we go back to the episode eight with the nuclear bomb where she was, uh, where the Lorba was dispersed. Did he disperse her to this picture? To the uh, Palmer household? I think she fell to Earth where Twin Peaks was. I think that's what I saw. Was it a picture of Earth? Yeah, I'm. I'm just trying to remember what it was like a picture map. It was. Yeah, it was like a map or something or a globe, and then okay. she falls towards America and it goes to like the upper corner of Washington. <laughs> but yeah, I, there's some interesting scenes that take place here where. We see more of these teapot looking things, these electricity conduits. Um, yeah, that's it's it's interesting. This connection with this buzzing and humming and all these like electrical sounds, even at the beginning of the episode, every episode has like mm -hmm. happening. Rancho uh, Rosa. Rosa, yeah, yeah. There's some element to this that is about electricity, is about nature versus man-made things. But there's so many the... subliminal things being thrown at you. <laughs> yeah. The there is a physical location in the return called Rancho Rosa. That's like the uh Well and the double R, right? R R Rancho yeah. Rosa. Yep. Rancho Rosa is the neighborhood. I th where it's Dougie at least lives. the place where Dougie. Yeah, I don't know if it's where Dougie lives, but or also the like place a housing where, like, development near Dougie. Because we saw he, when he got the ride from Jade. From Jade. Jade gave two rides. Yeah, they drive by that Rancho Rosa housing development. Um, and then also that I think is the same housing development where uh, fucking. Tim Roth and uh, the, I forget Hutch and uh, Chantel. Chantel, yeah. Where they were doing their calends. Yep. Um, so we have Doppelcoop being transported via the giant to Twin Peaks Sheriff's Department and we have the person Nido in the jail cell just getting kind of flustered and whacked out because she can sense something is off something that she is remembering probably from her past um, and then we have Andy with a picnic basket that boy Andy did <laughs> Cooper Agent Cooper um, I have something perfect for you a picnic basket we get a nice scene here of uh, Chad taking a key out of his boot and unlocking a door and um, getting out. And then we have Andy here meeting Cooper, the Doppelcoop with the most unsettling smile or half smile. <laughs> Hello, Lucy. Um, oh, yeah. There's that. I don't know if you can go back a little bit to when he's outside. And then, like, right on Coop's... There's a shot right on Coop's face. I don't know if you can get to it. Oh, uh, 
it's probably back here. Oh, right there. there you go. You can see the line of his contact right there. You see that? Missable details. Thank you, Bradshaw. <laughs> yeah. No, it was just a little fun thing I noticed. That's all. A little fun thing for everybody. He's got very <laughs> dark, dark eyes. It's a little fun Does thing. Not look human. Black eyes, like a doll's eyes. So um, I like I like noticing stuff like that. Yeah. And so it's just you know. No, it's good to point out. I'd say that close up makes it very unsettling to to look him in the eyes because it yeah, no. doesn't have any life in him. It's... Hell yeah. Um, Chad grabs a gun out of the gun locker and starts ridiculing Andy, poor Andy. Um, but then we get Hulk hands helping him out by punching the freaking door open onto Chad. And Chad falls down concussed pretty much and Andy just cuffs him up. And uh, that's the end of Chad. <laughs> Great job, Andy. Great job, Hulk hands. Adios, Chad. Um, then um, a really interesting scene here happens, I think, where Lucy gets a call from, obviously, Cooper. And she's like, what? She gets all freaked out. And then she's, like, probably instructed not to tell Sheriff Truman, like, don't say it's Cooper. It's just an important phone call. And, like, uh. I was waiting for her to spill the beans. I don't know about you guys, but I was like, she's going to screw something up or right. something's gonna happen. Blow it. Nope. After all this time, she's learned. Yep, so uh, Coop talks to Truman, saying he's almost there. He's on the uh, outside of Twin Peaks, so just keep uh, him talking, I guess, and then what's really interesting is that, yeah, you can see Sheriff grab towards his, his gun, um, but before anybody can really react... Lucy jumps in with a nice shot to um, Doppelkoop. Um, which is really interesting because if we go back, there was a few scenes that happened when we had that episode with Andy, like Who's the Dreamer, um, where he was imagining putting Lucy in this doorway. And we're like, why did he move her right here? Right. Because I, I thought that was kind of odd. Because we saw all these other things where he's he's doing things and, he, you know, he's making these little steps to understand what the fireman's trying to tell him. And there was that scene where he moves her and places her right here. And for mm -hmm. what reason? It doesn't get paid off till this scene. We're like, oh, he must yep. have knew that she needed to be in this space to help kill this evil coop. I don't know why he would put Punky in such a situation. <laughs> <laughs> Punky. <laughs> uh, she just... She, she's the least assuming person. She's like the... I don't, I don't know. That's very the true. The most... The person to be, like, the most effective in that moment, at that time. Mm hmm And she finally figured out how cell phones work, so... <laughs> the real winner... That's what she has to say in that moment. The She's real like, winner I finally here. figured out how cellular phones work. Judy's the real winner. Or, I mean, yeah, she's Lucy's the real winner here. Hey, she's got... No uh, spoilers. But... She's got the owl pendant on oh. and everything still, you know? She's yeah! The, the, <laughs> secret, the secret hero. Look at that. The woods behind her, too. Woods got her back in the falls, it looks like, over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That probably is the Snoqualmie Falls. Um, so, yeah, everybody gets out of the cell cell block, and then, um, yeah, even Hawkward comes running, like, what's going on? That is Coop. Um, this whole scene just gets so wacky because we get the broad shows showing up. <laughs> Some good uh, good shots of them just digging into the doppel coop. Coming in for a good old <laughs> <laughs> Grabbing his face. Dude, just spreading the fucking, we're making a movie all over there, dude. It's an inside joke. None of you will get it, but we got it. So the ripping. <laughs> is spreading the, like, using that as a noun? <laughs> spreading yeah. the making a movie? Spreading the, yeah, dude, making, spreading the, the making a movie all over the place. Spreading. Dude. We're making a movie. Um, so they're 
the the thing with these woodsmen is that they're digging a cavity in Doppelkoop's stomach to like take out the uh, black orb of Judy that conjured Bob. The borb. The borb. Yeah, the borb. The borb. So, as that's happening, the well, light, lighting changes and everything in Twin Peaks there, that makes it very eerie. The broad shows seem like they're doing the same thing they did last time they showed up. It's playing Coop just like, like a card spread and they're making a movie all over? Exactly. They're tickling their ivories. Yeah. But, but Always. this time, the borb comes out. Last time it didn't. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know what that difference is. It looks like a little necrotic shit ball, so it makes perfect sense that the brachos are bringing that out. You know? That's a good point. <laughs> would it? Would do you think it would have anything to do with when he was put in the cage and we saw that black flame, kind of like coalesce around him, or you know, like was it because he was put in a cage now and taught a lesson by the giant and then put back. That now the guys can open up his cavity and release the borb. Maybe it was the the place or the circumstance of him being like killed by Lucy or I don't know. I don't know what made the borb appear, but that was obviously the plan because it seems like the firemen sent him there as a trap. Well, here's here's another thing. I don't think he before when the broad shows were tearing open him and doing the we're making a movie they he wasn't killed by like he was protected somehow because he wasn't replaced and he wasn't raptured right he wasn't raptured to then be put back into the world like he was at Jackrabbit Palace he went to Jackrabbit Palace he gets raptured and then he gets put back and maybe something in that transitionary place made him more vulnerable to these attacks by the broads. Yeah, man, I, I don't know. It, something changed. Something happened where now the board comes out, right? So mm -hmm. I, I that allows Freddy to have... What what is the equivalent of me destiny for his destiny? Him him destiny? I don't know. Him destiny happens <laughs> for him destiny. Himstony. Himstony. What about Fred, what about Herstony? It's Fredstony. Yeah, it's all signed up. It's Fredstony's moment here. <laughs> he punches Bob a few freaking times, and he just is, gets the crap beat out of him too. Is that like? Did they just use like archival footage of fucking? Bob just like being angry or was yeah. that CG or what I'm sure it was just I'm sure it's just using footage that they already had of him huh. so we got okay. Freddy so they probably had a bunch of him doing various fucking ah, 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 you know what I yeah. mean yeah. well and he also had the, the catch you with my murder bag so that's probably that same yeah like filming session where they were just having him be like Wah, yeah in front of a fucking camera I like love this scene 15 too. Minutes. The Mitchums are just showing up. <laughs> like our first time in Twin Peaks, we go to a sheriff's a sheriff's department and we watch this British kid with a Hulk hand just punch a <laughs> big orb. <laughs> They're just like, cool. <laughs> we make a wisecrack. We say, something to tell the grandkids, huh? <laughs> something to tell the grandkids. Yeah, this whole scene. Um, so yeah, Freddy punches the thing into smithereens. Um, and that's the end of the idea of Bob, I guess. Bye, Borb. My Borb. Where, you where won't be the the Borb is like floating aggressively towards Freddy, but it's like physically clawing him and like tearing him apart mm. is uh, unsettling. This whole scene was shot very unsettling, like. The, you could yeah. say most of the series was shot on set. <laughs> yes. Well, this hear. this had a lot of weight to it, though. The other ones I could handle because I could. You I mean, other than the the one where it was all black and white and it was that episode that was like just, I was worried that whole episode. These one, this one, like made me very unsettled because of Bob and we actually see a manifestation Bob. of the orb. 
and everybody there witnessing this. The other ones, yeah, it's just right. like audience witnessing stuff. But like we get to see Truman, we get to see Andy, we get to see the Mission Brothers just stare at this thing that's happening in front of them, and it's like, oh, this shit's real. This is fucking yeah. weird and real. That's, that, 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 that's what I'm saying. It's like the the Mission Brothers, they get shown showing up like after Bob gets shot, or 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 after a certain point. Yeah, or yeah. After after the broad shows show up, so for any of these people, what the fuck is going through their heads? What are they thinking? Like Lucy, how does is she is she gonna tell goddamn Michael Sarah about this in two weeks? Where she's like, this weird yep. thing happened. And... <laughs> I I shot Cooper, but it wasn't Cooper. Yeah, I sh I shot Agent Cooper. You remember I told you about him? I shot Agent Cooper, but it wasn't Agent Cooper. It, uh, yeah. But they are forever changed, I think. And this is very interesting now because we get um, Cooper here staring at uh, Nido. And then this is the moment I was talking about where he's just suspended in this trance with her. Um, but everything's happening around him. And he's talking to everybody about Pedro Briggs and the significance of why he was doing this and what he still needs to do. Is um, he maybe imagining this? Is is that why time is frozen? Is be, is it because like in real time he uh, Borb is defeated and then and then Dale goes over and then all of a sudden like he looks at Nido and then bam he and Diane and uh, Gordon Cole are in the basement of the northern and in that moment he's having like this like mo your life flashes before your eyes where he's having an opportunity to be the dale cooper of old and like lay the mystery out in front of everybody and and i'm be... thinking yes i'm thinking yeah, yeah i know where you're going with that and uh, that's what i was trying to get at initially when i was like what is the significance of this why why are we seeing this still frame after he locks eyes or his eyes to Diane Nido's face mm -hmm. and what does that mean here I'd like to know you know anybody this is a call to anybody and else that maybe has an idea of why he's locked in this gaze overlapping with um, him basically saying goodbye to the people he's met and his friends and things like this that is his, his inner self can't keep away from Nido because he knows it's Diane. Deep down, he knows. And that's that's holding his part of his attention the whole time. Is that hold up? This shit, I know what this shit is. I just gotta see my bros quit and I'll come back to it. That's what it is. Boom, solved. <laughs> there that definitely could be, but then like he puts up his hands to her and then he has that same look on his face mm -hmm. if we if we are to because some of these people here are sent here specifically to play a part um and whom they are sent by or why or the circumstances are are beyond this conversation but like there are people that are here for a reason so I, I feel like the other people are also here for a reason. Right? Andy, Lucy, uh, Dale, probably Hawk, probably Bobby. They're all there for a reason. One, Gordon Cole. One reason to play this part in this interaction. So, what about the Andys? Why are they there? To make sandwiches? What the fuck? I'm like, yeah, it's so that the go. Andes can meet the Andy, dude. <laughs> if, they, if they have to be there, why do they have to be there? Why not? I, Eric, that is kind of my question. <laughs> like, I'm so glad that they are included in this pivotal of moment of moments in Twin Peaks. <laughs> they, 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 they don't seem bothered whatsoever. Not at they're the they, only ones not to witness that fuck you fest too. Oh, and Bobby too, I guess. Well, Bobby saw something. 
they could have been standing around the corner. Like, we don't know that they didn't witness anything. That's fair. <laughs> I I assume they witnessed everything. And they're just there being like, I'm glad we made enough sandwiches. So uh -huh. we now know that this person that was chirping, you know, at the was it the first episode where Cooper was trying to navigate the the weird realm and th this person was saying like like yelling or like pleading with him, "Don't go in that door, don't go in that door, go in this door or like wait, wait, stop doing that." Yeah, I think it was two or three maybe. Mhm. Mm um we know that now Diane is truly trapped within this pustule thing. <laughs> this wound. It looks so gross. I don't know what the fuck it is, but it's like the head of the baby from Eraserhead. Almost. Yeah. Um, and he seems like happy. A, <laughs> there's like a the same kind of black orb that has Bob in it is like inside of that pustule is what it looks like there. Yeah, true. But now she comes out looking like she has the the red room's curtains on her head and the floor on her nails. Um and he gives a kiss. There was a there was a something about a kiss in one of the episodes too, right? I know Lady D mean? Lady D gives a kiss. But there's also like Oh wait, maybe I'm thinking of the um, secret history where something would happen where um, Judy would do something with a kiss. Don't know. I. It's been a little bit since I uh, experienced the secret history, but... It, but it's a good sign of, like, love, right? It's like, it's not a... It's, mm. it's another uh, element of the show where it's, you know, this conflicting nature of the fear and love and how Major Briggs hopes that love will solve everything, but it he fears that it, it won't. Um, I, it, the, the part that that weird with me is like she tells this very explicit, intimate tale about her experience with Doppelgoop. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's just so quick to jump in to like intimately and passionately kiss any kind of gooper. Yeah, that is kind of odd if you think about yeah. it. Yeah. But again, that but, was the tulpa that was, but, but that, that was but that feeding was the tulpa. So on the pain and sorrow. Maybe, 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 and 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 the part that like has brought me solace in in having that thought is like, well, it seems like this is the real Diane. Able she's to not tell talking. That this is the, that this is the <laughs> real tale. You know, like she, she's able to just into it immediately. Like, oh. This is the actual Cooper that I know that I can trust, that is okay, like, so. Right, and it's kind of interesting. She hasn't talked since she became the real Diane either, but the other one was, like, really vulgar and mean. This one's just, like, she... silent. And that's what we know from Diane from the original series, that she's just a character that was disembodied, but she didn't talk. Yeah, we'll, we'll continue to see how she operates, but... I don't. Th I I can pretty confidently say that she's probably not going to be like offensive or standoffish, like to any degree. That was probably right. just like fucking Tulpa Diane. Where whereas real Dale is sharp, uh, a man of action, a person who can no matter what he's faced with, he will find something to do about it and and in the end get it done. He's a person yeah. you can trust. He's a man of his word, etc., etc., etc. Dougie is the opposite of all of those things. So, if the Diane, the Tulpa Diane... Mr. Jackpots? Yeah, Mr. Jackpots! Not Mr. Jackpots, the well, original Jackpots Tulpa is, is... Dougie. <laughs> yeah. Pre-Mr. Uh, Jackpots. Pre-Mr. Jackpots. Diet Dougie. Yeah. Dougie. Dougie too. He, the... was, he was corrupt and, inact and, and was a lot of inaction and, yeah, the opposite of Dale. That's what I'm saying, is like, if the if the Tulpa versions of these characters are like their like character opposites, it kind of makes sense that these golden cores that we've seen before are like that we've seen them like crumble. The core 
When, no, like when when these tulpas get broken down, we've seen them like pop or crumble as if they're hollow, like they're a facsimile, uh, clearly, yeah. of the real thing. They don't contain the same thing, so they're just they're just brittle and hollow, like held together with spit and tape, and just yeah. like me, baby. So so I bet going forward that this Diane we will continue to see being yeah like. Maybe maybe more reserved and quiet, but also when she is going to speak, being like supportive, uh, being somebody that will like document and take things down, and be like, "Got it, I'm here to help." And yeah. Mm -hmm. So right, right here, uh, Coop is saying goodbye to Gordon and Diane. Which, just to go back to the Diane thing, which is kind of what she was, because like. The whole thing, all we know of Diane is Coop sending his logs or his whatever to her, which would mean she would be someone who documented his stuff, right? Exactly. And she she's she's good at being the person, like, he he gives her, in, in those tapes, he's like, Diane, I need you to send me my earplugs or whatever. And she fucking gets it taken care of. So right. she, she not only has his back, like, logistically like she she's the person who's able to do these things but she's the person who will when given the opportunity jump at the opportunity to like help her friend help somebody that she cares about right mm -hmm. whereas the Tulpa Diane was like no you have to like beg me basically to help you do yeah, anything fuck this shit you Albert I, I, I want a drink if I'm gonna do anything um so Back, um, Cooper asked Sheriff Truman for the key that he was given by Ben of the Great Northern. Yeah, for his room key. Yeah. Room key. So he uses the room key in this basement of the the Northern to go in in this dark room where he's approached by Mike or the yeah. the talking forward Mike. The we've seen him just talk backwards this whole series. Yeah, it's 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 weird that we see. Is like, that a symptom of the waiting room? Maybe. I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. Because no, 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 no. Because we saw. No, because they do it in the. Uh, they do it in the. No, I was gonna say they do it in the convenience store too, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they absolutely do, and they do it in the uh, the room with that lady where she's like, "My mother, she's coming." They they do it in multiple places. So, so to me, that's always seemed like a symptom of another realm or world that is so detached that like that's how communication comes through. But it's weird right. here that this is like one of the few times that we see a depiction of the spirit Mike not talking backwards. Yeah, you're right. Um. But he he just says the uh, fire walk with me poem, and mm -hmm. they go for a nice ride. They, yeah, uh, got it. Yeah, they walk through the same portal that Doppelcoop went to go talk to Philip Jeffries, and basically where they're going now is they're traveling through this kind of nexus realm mm -hmm. where they go yep. to the convenience store, and then the convenience store leads them up to this other motel. Motel. Yeah. You, Where, do you know what they do? The way right station. Here? Oh my god, dude. What the I just I just put it together and I don't know why. I feel stupid. Not it. it means you're smart. You put it together. You through the darkness. Together. Look at look at these scenes, okay? Through the darkness, a future past. The magician mm -hmm. longs to see. One chance out between two worlds fire mm. walk with me so mm. yes eric line by line let's go through that here through the darkness of futures past yeah jesus Excellent. i mean that's like as literal as it can get with yep. with either dale walking here with mike through this hallway through the forest at the same time or later on walking through the forest with Laura hand in hand in the past. The future is come to the past, walking through the darkness. The magician longs to see. If if anybody in this show were to be called magician, like a, 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 a real human figure making magic come to life, I think that we could very safely say that they, that could be interpreted as Dale Cooper. 
because when he's throwing the rocks and and doing this like intuitive guessing of or or when or when these characters around him are like how did he know that or like how did he do that i don't know he's like a magician he's doing magic he longs to see he's 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 seeking the truth one chance out between two worlds well i mean good golly that could be a number of things right right that's just like a lot of things happening in this show what does that saying mean one chance out one chance out well just one figure chanting out me chant uh you know having connotation of like religious or spiritual aspect where they're they're they are putting belief or or thought or feeling into this if they're chanting out between two worlds okay that that's a lot that's philip jeffries that's dale cooper that is bob that is mike that is laura that like that's a number that's leland that's a number of people that's jumping man that's the that's pointy nose jumping man um Fire. Yeah, Stone Temple Pilots music video. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's uh, I think an interstate love song. I would love to. I, 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 I'm gonna have to look that up. But fire, walk with me. I I see that as being again the same kind of thing as like, if if Dale is walking with Laura, and if fire has been something that has been brought up throughout this entire franchise. And most of the time, it gets brought up in the context of Laura. Maybe not directly, like, linked to her, but in the same conversation. I'm connecting those two things. Fire, walk with me. Dale is taking fire, Laura, this, like, catalyst that Bob wants, that maybe Judy wants, that that is important, that was spit out by the giant. He's taking her home to a safe place where she cannot be accessed by this evil, uh, like, part of things. I don't know. That, right. All of a I sudden... Say, I'm, seeing what you put, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah. All of a sudden, the, the, the poem took on a whole new context to me. Right. Sure. We were given some context to it. Um, we were given context. So we have now the owl symbol turning into another symbol two diamonds and then that forms an eight or an infinity symbol or an infinity symbol uh, but we have also this little uh, ball it's a little ball sitting on the eight orb yep. little and orb. if we just watch here the ball turns with yep the it's sitting eight. on the right side but it's now, been lips yep. over Mirrored. And it's on the left side, and then it moves back to the right side. The ball itself. Ah, like, oh, here we go. So the ball moves. So before the eight flipped, right? The ball stayed where it was, but now the ball moves itself back to its original spot on the same curve. Mm -hmm. But the the opposite, but the same. So but... it's the same, but now, from knowing how infinity, it, the, the infinity symbol moved also. It's not mm -hmm. the exact same spot, in a no, sense. It's the opposite. But it's the opposite. But did the did the ball same move of its own volition, or did something yeah. move the ball? Maybe. I think the ball. Well, let's just watch it again. We'll watch. Did Billy J do it? Because he couldn't see it before. I don't know what the significance of the ball is. Is he trying to find Laura? Is that the ball that Philip Jeffries is trying to find? He's trying to ball. locate the proper place in which to be. He's is okay. The, the ball like, is the date. The, past, the ball is the date the past, from what we can gather past, because he the says the past is the present. Sure. The past yeah. The present. Uh, yeah. The, the date. The, the ball is the date. Sure. The, the ball's at where the present is. He yeah. Flips it, brings it back to where yeah. it was, but on a different side, and now it's the past. Right. He puts it down. He flips it. He reverses it. He put his thing down, flip it, and reverse it, like Wilson said earlier. Yes. Missy so, yes. this episode is called The Past Dictates the Future. What I'm saying is... It... Who, who is the character to say that? Cooper. Well, Cooper yeah, says yeah, it yeah. when yeah. once he 
is the Dup Doppel Cooper is dead, and then he says that to the the audience, like he says that to everybody there at the sheriff station. So, um, yep. In this in in this date, so we know that if we know that he asked Philip Jeffries to find this date, February twenty uh, something or whatever. Yep. Nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, I think that is the date that Laura died. So this is the ball of Laura's death. But why is it there? And he can't see it. But then once well, the eight flips around in three-dimensional space, and then the ball goes back to where it was before, he can now see it. He's like, ah, there it is. What do you mean he can now see it? Because he says... No, no, no. There Steve it Martin's is. supposed to be. That's that. Hold on. Hold on. There it is. Keep keep going. He says, there it is. You can go in now. Right. I. Th my my, my question let's, was let's why, why he didn't recognize it when it was there already. Why did it well, have to do its motion? And then he's like, there it is. Now you can go in. Well, Tyler, <laughs> Philip Jeffries kind of told us last time, like, I think for him doing any of these, like taking any specific action other than just existing is like somewhat difficult or like ob obtuse for him. Because he says, like, it's slippery in here. And he's always saying things like, where are you? Where am Where are we? Did you ask me this? When is it? So he like was somehow able to take this action to find this date for Dale, but it took him a little bit. And and I think visually what we're seeing here is like that action taking place in like searching and finding this date somehow. And then he's like, there it is. Like he's he's finally found the thing he's looking for. And then he's like, it's it, it's like you're looking through a, a, a keychain, a big janitor's keychain of keys. You know that they're all on there, but you got to find the right one. So he's like looking through, flipping through, and he finds the right key, sticks it in the lock, turns the key. There it is. You can go in now. Is it, is 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 how it always seemed to me? So you're saying that right now he's manipulating this figure, eight infinity, and then he's this isn't a representation of the date. This is just a representation of him kind of unlocking that portal for him to go to it yes because the same kind of thing happened with with mr c and and that's that's why cooper has to go here is because philip jeffries is the only person that can facilitate this transition for him interesting so, so he, he he gave he gave him the coordinates right the, all those numbers that popped up were other coordinates right the coordinates were from Mr. C, no, no, we're from uh, Philip Jeffries to Mr. C, and I think those were corroborating the trap. Yes, 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 because we saw, we saw, we saw uh, Richard show up immediately after Mr. C left the convenience store, and they started talking about coordinates. They went, they searched out the coordinates. It was the trap. So, so Philip Jeffries fed Mr. C false information, false coordinates that somebody else also gave him like I think a, I think Ray or a contact of Ray maybe or I'm, Judy I'm guaranteeing even. you it was Major Briggs well here's the thing because he they, was there they, they when that. he finally gets raptured and trapped and then he's in the cage and who's there looking Major Briggs yep. like looking right at him like got you trapped fucker I th so you're right but slightly different I think because Remember, remember when he made that like satellite phone call to somebody, and we don't know who is. We never ever have found out who's on the other end. But he's like, I was expecting to talk to a, a Major Briggs, but they gave him coordinates. I'd have to go back like, and watch that. But so it was like that's episode, really interesting. It's getting yeah more. He was in almost a, more convoluted, but more opening up to like answering some of these things that are kind of just left there, and why yeah. The significance of Major Briggs is still prevalent in this so, space. Major Briggs, after death, fed him 
like he still kept the real coordinates and was able to keep that from Mr. C, but fed him two false coordinates that should have led him to a trap, but sadly he had Richard there to walk into the trap, you know, for him. Yep. And then he went to the third coordinate, which was Jack Rabbit's palette. And the reason that we know for a fact that it's Mr. C who had the real coordinates is because that's what he fed exactly to Bobby. He probably we don't... got that subscription, which is why Richard, he brought Richard along, and then Richard got zapped, so that was some sort of confirmation, right? Mm-hmm. That it was a trap. Yep. Yeah, that, yeah, that's confirmation it was a trap, and that poor Jerry thought his binoculars... <laughs> He wanted to be sure. Yeah, yeah, but right. He turned himself in, dude. Like, what a he good He got man. all the way to fucking Wyoming without, you know, and got completely naked at some point. But, but I think that this here is Dale, you know, entering into this space where uh, after all this time, he's realized what he needs to do or where he needs to go. And, and what the part of the catalyst that it took for him to go where he needs to go was the key, the three, the 315 room key he was able to use that to like direct himself to one place to talk to Philip Jeffries to get Philip Jeffries to help facilitate sending him back to the one part that he needed to go to oh god the fan but yeah <laughs> of course it's got to show up the 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 pen ultimate episode i knew was going to give me agita and i feel so worked up and like <laughs> I don't. I, I'm tr- I'm trying my hardest just to like figure this out, but I don't feel like I I really know anything. I'm just really trying to, you know. <laughs> Laura's face is how I feel. I'm, yeah, like, I'm watching this entire episode just like. <laughs> so then we get this scene where <sighs> Cooper gets to go back in time, to when. Uh, well, we got Leland shot too here. Uh, Leland Bob kind of face going on Great eyes. <laughs> um, staring at Laura going out with James um, what, what about this James <laughs> oh. <laughs> so yeah this is the what about this James where she gets super unhinged and just best scene pretty great in all of Twin Peaks but this whole time Fuck Cooper's you, been James. watching and not saying really anything and Laura freaks out after seeing him and um, she just starts breaking down and James like what are you talking about Bobby killed someone and we, like I forgot that Bobby killed somebody back back in the day yeah alright fire walk with me and fire walk with me yeah the drug dealer guy right yes yeah Um, some great shots though here maybe unused stuff but or more like a deleted scene or just extended scene yeah. from fire walk with me it said david lynch was just like i can use this mm-hmm. so she jumps off his bike and she runs into the forest where well we get a shot of leo and this chick that's kind of nice um and they're waiting with Jacques. Is that who that is? Or Jean? One of the Renault bros. Um, she meets Dale in the forest. And they have a, a kind of a weird heart to heart where he doesn't really say anything to her. She just talks to him. And does she say, am I dreaming? I've seen you in my dreams. Am yeah. I dreaming? Yep. Which is very interesting from what we know and what we've been, you know, the dream theory and everything with um, Laura being conjured by the, the giant and things like that. Um, so at this point, it's getting to be a Cooper wants to take her to Jackrabbit Palace I'm assuming um, because he says we're going home so he leads her away from where um, Laura is going to be picked up by 
Jacques, or like they're. It seems like they were waiting there, right, mm -hmm. for Laura. They're gonna yeah. have a, a grand old time, and he's just waiting there. Leo, Jacques, Ronette, everybody's there. Yep. So Laura goes with Cooper instead, and that changes events. So she, her body disappears from the side of the lake. Pete's able to go fishing. Pete goes fishing in peace, yeah. and we have Josie Packard checking herself out in the mirror, not a care in the world, really. But not in the wood. Do you remember me talking about how, uh, like, in in, a, in in some kind of early draft, they were going to plan to have Josie be, like, a sister to Judy, or somehow one was tied to the other, and... and you know, that could have led to questions of like, oh, is Josie like a spirit or, or blah, blah, blah. Here, if we if we keep watching a little bit, th like, Laura's not here, but Josie has a moment of like looking out the window and almost looking, I don't know, strange. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> she does. She's like, huh. Like, nothing curious? Happening. Yeah, yeah. Or, or just being like, and it's not happening? Well, okay. I just wonder what this world without Laura's body would be like. You know? Pretty chill. Did she, did she live? Or is she just not there? I think she lived. But we see quickly after this, then, that Judy's not happy about that. <laughs> right? Well, that's the thing. We know that in the past now, the night before, everybody's like, you know, putting on their makeup in the morning and stuff like that. Um, people are going about their day, but we know now that in this time, this timeline now, there's not a body and Laura is still raptured because... Um, That's what I'm saying. Is she raptured or, or, or does like Laura show up to school that day? Yeah, I think it just she gets like taken anything. away. Coop? She's not with Coop anymore. We know that she is disappeared. She just is in the wind now. But I, I, I think sure, that, yeah, I, I think the separate the, idea is that I think, I think one is different than the other. I don't think I think they're mutually ex not not mutually. I think that they're separated. Well, I, I think I think the idea being through this string of things that happens here is that. Um, is that Coop saves Laura, therefore Laura not dead body anymore, Laura alive. So things go as usual until Judy starts freaking out in the quote unquote present slash future. Um, yeah. Cause, cause then we go, we go to the, the Palmer household and um, what's her, what's the mom's name? Sarah. 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 You, you hear like Sarah's freaking out like there's all sorts of moans and groans happening and all this like whatever and she's in there then with Laura's picture and she is smashing a bottle on it she's destroying the frame but she's not destroying the picture um, which I took as symbolically being her trying to destroy to 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 keep Laura destroyed, but she's not. She's she's not destroyed. She's like she's quote unquote alive. She can't be whatever. So she freaks out. Mm -hmm. And um, assuming since she's a an other dimensional being, Judy, that she's outside of space and time, we she's back. Uh, as Coop's leading uh, Laura through the woods. Um, he hears some whooshing or whatever and he looks back and Laura's not there anymore and then he hears all the horrible screaming of her and stuff like that it's it's Judy coming back being like no fuck you you're messing with my plans I'm correcting this this is not what's happening um, so I, I assume Laura was saved in that moment for a moment um, as as you know, people will say time loops on itself and whatever. So it's like her being saved there creates the the uh, different um, different events with uh, 
with old Nancy boy, which also creates the situation where Judy is freaking out over the picture of Laura. So she's going back to correct the the thing, right? Um, that's how I saw it anyway. I'm inclined to believe that's part of it. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to agree with that. Um, there might be more to that time. thing. It's the time is a flat circle thing, right? Where like yeah, exactly. everything exists, everything exists at once. Laura right. is somehow, you know, one one way or another, sadly destined to just not be able to like live a normal life. Mm-hmm. She's she's destined to be out of the picture somehow. Yeah, yeah. That was her her point of existence is to not exist anymore at a certain point to to be yeah maybe maybe a sacrifice be sacrifice like, yeah she's a sacrificial a lamb for you know the the the, the greater change yep. of other people around her or something like yep. that she's a sacrificial lamb to put events in motion and i guess it's a good place to end um yeah because damn, the next dude. episode is it's called, the final episode it's the final one and it's called, What is Your Name? Yeah. My name is FBI. Do you think <laughs> it has anything to do with Laura Palmer? Yes, 100%. <laughs> 100%. Um, I have a feeling that once we see this, it will have some answers for us. Is, is hopefully to... but knowing david lynch there's also going to be like More three questions. million questions that get raised to counter those questions that get answered you well, know we can I mean? work through it guys we can work through this oh, we, yeah, can, we, can. We, can, we can come up with a satisfying we'll combine all of our ending for us uh, all. We'll, we can be... we'll combine all of our our brain wrinkles right. to figure gonna, it out i'm gonna do the same thing i always do i'm gonna watch the episode and then i'm gonna talk about how i feel about it and if it if it doesn't exactly. line with how you guys feel about it, that's great. That's fine. That's fine. I think I, that's what David Lynch wants. I think that's I, what he wants. That's what I want. I want you guys to say, well, there's another thing too. Like, yeah, that's part of the fun of this. Let's right? dig into this. That's part of the fun. That's the part of the fun deep, of Twin Peaks. The deep to see what we go. find and what it means to to each of us, right? Is, I think I think the final episode when we when we post it should be subtitled "Cold Ones for Twin Peaks." <laughs> yeah, we should all have some cold. We should all have some cold ones next Tuesday for Twin Peaks. Sure, I could probably do yeah. that. Um, I mean, it's it's apropos, but yeah, yeah. No, we don't have to have an excessive amount of cold ones. Just like you know, just a cold one. It's just, I just like going deep and talking deeper Me of too. the ideas that are being thrown at us and what yeah what they should mean to each of us you know what you oh, think yeah. of that what i think of this what wilson mm-hmm. thinks of that and then what speaks to us yeah what we extrapolate from those ideas because I, I mean i think we you know we extrapolated some good answers i mean we we you know through through various bouncing off of each other through um through catching for for instance like the numerology thing catching that is like is just things that we're watching and gathering as we're doing it. We, we're able to put together at least a a um a like feasible um idea of some of the things that are going on and what some of these things mean. You know what I mean? I do. Subje- subjectively. I oh, I I definitely want you guys to bring your own ideas to the table because then that's the stuff that gets my brain going to think about like well what about that or or things tertiary to that or like i mean with our powers combined we are captain planet right so i mean (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's that's always been you know that's that's always been the thing about entertainment is it's the water cooler it's and Mm -hmm. it's not even this this tv show it's it's you know all of these different things that we this just happens to be the the piece of media of choice to do this with right but i think that that like this piece of media 
and and how we've talked about it and this being the penultimate episode uh-huh. I'd, I'd, I'd like to just speak to, for a moment to like the idea that us as Fargo knots what we do is we try to just talk about the things that bring us some sort of joy or or mm-hmm. interest or entertainment intrigue yeah and so this is absolutely that for all three of us yeah oh yeah I've this fucker's come... full of intrigue my guy there's there's a lot and i mean with with watching the original we series could... with you guys and Bracho's dream soul for a lot yeah, too but... um yeah. going back don't discount this... that boy that boy brought some things <laughs> some great yes, stuff it brought mainly one thing but <laughs> oh yeah dude. but the um hey, it added yeah just the ability to discuss something more in depth and different, you know, varying because we're watching it some like we're watching it together, which is one thing. Mm-hmm. It's different when like after Instead of on our own, which we you, usually do, right? Yeah, after you For watch something else. and then like you come to the water cooler and you talk about it and then you're like kind of remembering things, but here we have like it's fresh instant, instant gratitude we have like we can just jump to the thing we're talking about and just divulge yep. what do we see here guys what what is this what is the and we have it that? we have it fresh in our mind too it's not diluted by time right yeah so that's another aspect of why it's fun to do this as a group and then you know continuing that mm-hmm. so yeah we'll be back with the final episode of the return what is your name in the final episode of twin peaks it, before the final peaks guys mm-hmm. before we leave I'd like yeah. to share something special with with my two Broichi boys as well as our uh, our viewing audience here. Okay. Oh yeah. So I recently uh, purchased a piece of Twin Peaks merchandise. Uh, yes. It's Twin Peaks behind the scenes, an unofficial an unofficial visitor's guide to Twin Peaks. Mm. Uh, published in 1991. Interesting. Uh, I'm just going to read the back of it very quickly. Creators David Lynch and Mark Frost reveal the genesis of the concept that gripped America. The cast, writers, and directors comment on every episode in exclusive interviews, a complete guide to every show, an examination of the phenomenon that created the offbeat television series, plus an exclusive look at the future of the show. And interesting. It's got, like it says in there, an examination of every single episode uh one through 16 the original one through 16 Mm -hmm. and it's oh like (sighs) episode 12 at 6 42 a.m cooper awakens and does a handstand in his hotel room at the great northern in his inverted position he sees a note underneath the bed addressed to my special agent cooper opens it i've gone north the note reads jack may have the answer love audrey so it's like it breaks down every episode. Uh, yeah. There are there are interviews with the cast, with the crew, with there's there's exclusive pictures taken for this thing. It's it's really really incredible for anybody that uh, is cool. interested in Twin Peaks Mania. One of the things that I wanted to share with the two of you mm-hmm. is a small part that's the ten best theories about who killed Laura Palmer. No. <laughs> Love to hear I'm going to give you guys five through ten. I'm going to save those those top for another time. Right? Okay. So, mm-hmm. number five on the ten best theories about who killed Laura Palmer is Laura Palmer suicide theory. Mm. As Cheryl Lee so eloquently put in her in an interview once, she killed herself. And then wrapped herself in plastic and jumped into the water. <laughs> Plausible. Number seven. Mr. Potato Head. Wait, what about number six? Did we Okay. Agent Cooper. You said five you said five through ten, right? Or what did you do six through ten? Well, I mean sorry. I'm doing I'm doing six through ten because if oh, I do okay. sorry. Five, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Five and five here. So Mr. Potato Head. Leo Johnson? After all, (laughs) he did kill poor Waldo, the minor bird. I thought it was Leo, says director Caleb Deschanel, 
He was the obvious choice, but I later dismissed him because he was the most obvious choice. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's what everybody thought. That's what Dale thought, too. Yeah, it's too obvious. Too obvious. And then, as a fun little aside, the opposite page of the one I'm reading here has a full-page spread of an Esquire magazine, Women We Love. Um, and it's... Uh, she's cold. Laura Palmer. A little stiff at parties, but then so are we. <laughs> and it's uh, Cheryl Lee cover full... Sp- you know. Yeah. yeah. Well... No- <laughs> You guys are going to like this one. <laughs> Theory number eight, James Hurley. <laughs> Already great. What's this, James? <laughs> he had the broken heart, literally, figuratively, and otherwise. And Laura didn't exactly think the world of this introspective biker, as we later found out. Nobody did. I was, I was actually well. questioning more of the younger people like James, because he was really mysterious, says Madchen Amick, who was Shelley, never really much of a suspect to anyone. When the series went on and new characters came up, it uh, and new characters came in, I thought of the possibility of Laura dressing up as Madeline and the whole switch thing. But the more we went along, I thought it could be anybody. With David wow. and Mark, they could just bring someone in and say it's him. <laughs> wow. Mm. Just too big of a dumb dumb. Um, Num- you have more? Okay. Yes. Yeah. There's two. There's two more. Nine okay. and ten. Number nine, Diane. Mm. Out for revenge against Agent Cooper for leaving her in Philadelphia, Diane killed Laura Palmer, giving him a case he could never solve, trapping him in Twin Peaks forever, and thus solving the problem of how to keep Cooper in the town once the murder was solved. That's right. <laughs> That's right out there with being attacked by a flock of extraterrestrial owls. And then in parentheses, hmm? Hmm. I just said that. So which, hmm. which, like, Tyler, yep. I think, uh, you know, having read the secret history, that's that's extremely, like, uh, Nostradamus, like, telling of the future without knowing it. Yes, you're mm. right. You're right. Sky people, owls, harbingers yeah. of wisdom and omens yes yeah and then number 10 and this is a little bit of a bigger one so i'm just gonna get through it okay mm-hmm. daddy done it leland palmer don't be rid riddick a lick a nobody guessed leland except me yeah right an article in tv guide running prior to the series second season premiere Featured, se- featured several best-selling authors' personal speculations on their feelings about the beguiling mystery. Andrew oh. Greeley, author of The Cardinal Sins, guessed it was psychiatrist Dr. Jacoby. Quote, because he's most like Waldo, the Clifton Webb character who was the killer in the 1944 movie Laura. Uh, okay, ellip- nerd. Weird. Ellipses. It makes me think that Madeline, Laura's cousin, is really Laura, and that, as in the movie, the killer murdered the wrong girl. I also think it's the real Laura who shot Agent Cooper, because she believed he was getting too close to solving the murder. He jokes, quote, One thing I must say about Twin Peaks, it certainly has an extraordinary number of high school seniors who are gorgeous, certainly not like most high school seniors I've ever known. Unquote. All right, freak. The, weirdo. <laughs> the queen of soap literature, Jackie Collins, whose books include Lady Boss and Chances, guessed that it was Andy, Truman's deputy, and dismissed Leland because he's such a whiner and, a, and so hysterical that you can see his guilt coming out. <clears throat> and that doesn't explain anything about why she would guess it was fucking Andy. But continuing. <sighs> the reigning writer of romance also wrote that, quote, it's obvious Cooper wears a bulletproof vest because he eats so much he needs one to hold in his stomach. Unquote. And that, oh, quote, if someone what gave the me the choice you, of watching Knots Landing or Twin Peaks, I would opt for Knots. The oh, casting is brilliant, the but the show is somehow like Newville Cuisine. You can't really sink your teeth into it. Unquote. I'm doing that. I don't know what the fuck Knots Landing is. Knots <laughs> Landing? I can't sink my teeth uh, into that. Knots! I don't know. That's what I expect. Uh, Tony Hillerman, author of Coyote Waits and A Thief of Time, was critical of the show, dismissing it as, quote, adolescent and shows an arrogant disregard for the audience. 
If you take out the dog food commercials, you take out most of the intellectual content of the show. I really lose interest after the episode that finished with Cooper waking up from his dream and saying he knew who the killer was. The next week, there was no real follow-up. It reminded me of those old Saturday morning matinees where, Gordon, where Flash there Gordon was. and heroes like he him said were it. left on the brink of death, and the next week, they were back in the new adventure. Well, I'm not 11 years old anymore, unquote. God, that's so dumb, because yeah. he basically <laughs> says it. He's like, I know who the killer is, and Michael Onkin's like, okay, who is it? He's like, we need to figure that out. But yeah. I, I, like, I had all these messages like transmitted into my head. But, but here are the clues. Here are the clues that I need to so, figure out. One, one Sounds last like paragraph. a Knott's Landing guy. One last paragraph and we're done. Okay. Hillerman, though, did manage to guess that it was Leland who killed Laura Palmer. Quote, Given the kind of girl we know Laura was, and what a neurotic guy Leland is, it's possible that he could have bumped her off in a rage after he found she was working at One-Eyed Jack's. Unquote, he wrote. Okay. Frankly, he should have just stuck to guessing the killer without his off-mark explanation. They'd still pay off in Vegas, though. And that's the end. So, next time we He's right for the wrong others. reasons. Very right yeah. for the complete wrong reasons. A lot of these people are just off-base with their guesses. Like, yeah, the, their reasoning is kind of flawed and weird. It's only like yeah. really surface level. But it's, it's like it's because of we're this. seeing we're seeing this we're seeing this in retrospect though after knowing everything we know right. Yeah, True. it's I mean, it to me it's very quaint and just like cute. It and, is quaint. And, it is very quaint. It's they're all looking approaching it like it's like some regular ass TV show. But. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, it's just like a murder mystery, right? We just have to find out who killed her and then we win, right? So right? we're gonna watch Knots Landing, right, guys? <laughs> we'll watch you that next. Me. Hey. Why don't you show me? You are I'm, you I'm show down. Me? If it, I, mean, I don't even know what the fuck that is, dude. I don't know either. Let's let's find out. But I, I the rest of the book is like you know mainly interviews with cast, crew, directors, writers, Mark Lynch, David Frost. God damn it, David Lynch, Mark Frost. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, Kale, all the these fusions. People. So it, it really is uh, worth a look for anybody who's interested in this kind of. Twin Peaks production stuff. Yeah, uh, it sounds really cool. Um, and we'll leave it there. We yes. hope to see everybody back the next time we for watch the final, the final, um, the we'll ultimate some, episode, the ultimate, not pen, the not the penis ultimate, the ultimate. We're gonna do some cold ones for Twin Peaks. Cold ones for Twin Peaks next week, guys. Um, be ready. Be ready for that. And yeah. See you then. Bye. Bye. Bright you bye. <laughs>